<laughs> and thank you for visiting us today. Thank you. Clinical officers are still on strike. Uh, so yesterday, mm -hmm. uh, the court ordered us back to work. Mm -hmm. But now therein lies the problem. Mm -hmm. That we have been ordered back to work, but then whatever took us out of work has not been addressed. Mm -hmm. And whatever took us out of the workplaces is unsafe working environment mm -hmm. that presents imminent risk to our health as medics. Mm. And of course, if, if it presents a risk to our health, it also does to the patient. Mm. And so we are not out of the woods. Mm. Though we are going back in obedience of the court order, that does not guarantee that we are going to have uninterrupted services in the hospitals. <laughs> mm. So you'll go back, but you may not work. What I'm trying to say is, <laughs> The reason as to why we left the working station mm. was in compliance of Section 14 of the Occupation of Safety and Health Act mm. that says that when an employee, in his opinion or her opinion, feels that the working environment presents imminent risk to their health, they are mandated by law to vacate after reporting to the immediate supervisor and not to resume duty mm. until the environment is remedied. So we vacated because the working environment was unsafe. We are going back. If we do not have the protective gear that we went out looking for, if the environment is not conducive, mm. then the law tells us we cannot subject ourselves to harm when we know, and we, it's a matter of logic. And so when we do not have these protective gears, then we, we shall not work. The but court, when we have them, mm. we will of course work. When the court was ordering you back to work, was it interim order or was it after hearing what, you are, what your reasons were? They were interim orders uh, that were issued uh, yesterday. Mm -hmm. The case is still ongoing. And uh, we hope that in the fullness of time that uh, the court will be able to actually determine that we were, the, we were right because it's the employers who actually took us to court. Mm. But now the problem is, uh, at that time when the judgment or the ruling is going to be made, it will be too late. Whoever who will have been affected or have died from COVID-19 as a health worker because they were not protected, the best a court can say is that you, the employer, you didn't give the protection that you are supposed to give, but we will not be able to resurrect that person. Mm. So the damage will be done. And I think um, it is neglect on the part of the employers, and that is the county governments, because they are the ones which actually refused to uh, dialogue, to come to the conciliation table mm. and negotiate a framework to ensure that they remedy the working uh, environment. Because the national government under the Ministry of Health signed a return to work agreement that basically provided for a framework that uh, provides on how we were going together to remedy the situation to ensure that no other medic um, dies uh, from the same. But for the county governments, because uh, they felt that um, some of the items, probably the, the ones that uh, they, they, they in their press conference, they said they did not agree with, then they decided to throw everything out, to throw the baby with the bathwater. Peterson, may, let me ask you this question. Yes. One of the other things that the county governors pointed out was something funds. Mm. So... From one perspective, you could argue that the national government was throwing the county government under the bus. You sign this thing, but they need funding from the national government to be able to do these very same things that Depends. are at the heart of the discussion. Mm -hmm. now, if these funds are not, uh, were not available, how then are these county governments supposed to enact these things? I think what the county government uh, brought out to the public was what I would call a convenient narrative. Mm -hmm. If you look at the details of the return to work agreement, it actually does acknowledge that. Mm -hmm. And it says that the money is to come from the treasury to fund whatever was to be funded. It was not to come from the counties or from the uh, county allocation because in that allocation there was no consideration of what would come after. 
So that was taken into account. And uh, if you remember, at the start of this crisis, uh, the chairman then, the former chair, the Council of Governors, came out and said that though we know the grievances, the concerns by the health workers are valid, we as the counties, we do not have the capacity mm -hmm. because we don't have funds. And he said, uh, we want to plead with the national government to help us. And that is what informed the Ministry of Labor to constitute a multi-agency uh, team, uh, standing, standing committee, which actually basically represented every other department in government mm. that would be involved in making such a decision. Mm. That sat, deliberated, uh, made uh, its conclusion and reduced it into the return to work framework that we signed with the CS uh, Ministry of Health after the Chair Council of Governors giving his okay and the Chair Labor that they have seen the document and they are okay, they were going to sign later. Only for them to go back and refuse. Why do you think they went back, hmm. in your opinion? Uh, really speaking, I do not understand. They explained that they went back because they took it to the other governors. And the other governors in a full council meeting said, absolutely no way. You are not going to sign this on our behalf because we do not agree. Can you fault them for that? Yes, of As course. a chair of the Council of Governors, you represent the other 46 governors. Mm. And if the other 46 governors unanimously in a council meeting come and tell you, what we are reading here, we have issues with, we do not approve, you cannot sign. I, I, I think therein lies the problem mm -hmm. that for the Council of Governors, um, when it's convenient, the Council of Governors represents all of them. When it's not convenient, then the Council of Governors cannot make a decision on behalf of the 47 county governments. When we were being invited by the CS Labour for the conciliation meetings under the multi-agency, it was very clear in the letter. Mm. Send representatives with the capacity and the mandate to make decisions on the table. Mm -hmm. If at that point they felt that the people to be sent by the Council of Governors were not people they can be able to trust with that, then they should have said that each and every county wants to send one person. I think honestly, on the Peterson, table. this is a just, it's, it's a leadership issue, right? Yes. You as a chair of the Union of Clinical Officers, if you signed that and then your members came and started telling you, no, 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 Peterson, we disagree. What are you to do? You renege on what you've signed. You'd say, I have gone back to the membership and the members who sent me here with the authority to come and negotiate, have gone and said, absolutely not. I wouldn't agree. <laughs> because uh, then it, it means that uh, it's a failure of leadership, as you're saying. It's an issue of leadership, but the issue is failure. Because you're supposed to involve your people at every stage of the negotiation, of the discussion. Mm -hmm. And even at the onset, you are supposed to have agreed what are we as a group willing uh, to let go, what are we willing to give. Yep. And so there won't be such issues where you go back and they tell you that uh, one, two, three that you have signed, we actually don't agree with. Then the other question is, if you look at uh, the doctor's uh, agreement, which was signed also by the Council of Governors, mm. they're almost basically the same, except for the risk allowance, mm. which they were not, uh, which didn't seem to be a bigger issue to them. So what was the difference between the clinic officers and the doctors where they were able to sign? The when did allowance. they realize... The risk allowance is a when, when did they realize mm. that um, the Council of Governors does not have the mandate? If you're talking about the risk allowance, and uh, uh, you know sometimes in this country, and uh, I'm not political, mm. but I think it's <laughs> and, our and business. Hold, hold it, hold it, hold it. Uh, yes. Allow me to just pause there. You lead a union. Yes. And you're not political. Yes. Okay. I'm a unionist, not a politician. Oh. And, then, <laughs> and, the, and the difference is... <laughs> anyway, please carry on. <laughs> yeah. So, so what I'm trying to say is that in this country, for a common hardworking Kenyan, it is very difficult to negotiate anything. Mm. Why? But for politicians, it becomes very easy. It looks like a peer negotiation. Mm. 
If you look at uh, what we were added as clinic officers, in each year, it would cost this country 900 million, which is actually a drop in the ocean. Mm. We have just seen the MCAs being given 4.5 billion after. The SRC, which is supposed to be independent, uh, told us that there was no money and mm. it was not sustainable. Mm. But when it came to the MCAs, they said the money was there and they can actually be given. It was found. Mm. Yeah, I think as, uh, as Kenyans, sometimes we need to ask the questions. Peterson, since we're talking of questions, there's something I want to ask. It's yes. actually, there are two questions, not one. One, when we talk to members of this Council of Governors, one of the things that some of the members have told us is that medical workers, health workers, are very well remunerated as compared to other health workers, say, around us here mm. within East Africa, maybe on the continent? Question one, how true is that? Okay, you'll come and answer that. Let's take a break, see what's mm. happening on the roads, and then you'll respond to this particular question. We have in the studio Peter Sonoshira. He's the chairman of the Kenya Union of Clinical Officers. He's telling us why the clinical officers are not happy with a court order that directs them to resume work. This is the Situation Room, the only way to start your day. Spice up your life. So you've been directed to go back to work and you still say the reason why we went, uh, we were downing our tools is because we felt unsafe in our workplace and we uh, have reason to do to go on strike on those grounds. However, the court has ordered you to go back to work. Now, before we went to the break, City was asking you, governors have said and they've, you know, even come up with tabulation. How much we pay our healthcare workers in this country, you cannot compare to how much healthcare workers are paid regionally. How much we pay our healthcare workers in our counties, you cannot compare with how much we pay other cadres of professionals in the same county. What do you say to that? Um, I think um, the only way you can be able to compare pay is if you are going to do an analysis of the job done and then you can be able now to compare. SRC has been mandated to do that. Mm -hmm. SRC has twice uh, done an, a job analysis on the health workers and everybody else. I haven't uh, heard anywhere SRC say that we are uh, overpaid. Mm -hmm. Then, what do they mean by comparing with others? Most of the private facilities are paying almost double what we are paid in the government facilities. Mm -hmm. So there must be some uh, criteria you use for comparison. For example, a governor in Kenya is paid more than the, the, the president of the Somaliland. Should we say that the governor in Kenya is overpaid? Yes. Mm. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Well, there yes. must be a criteria that you look at to then say that um, comparing the work done by this one and this other one, mm -hmm. Then this one is uh, paid above whatever they are supposed to be paid. But uh, on the face of it, we cannot be able to do this. If you look at it, we have so many medics who are leaving government employment, going into private, and others even going overseas. Mm -hmm. If we were very well paid compared to other jurisdictions, do we have where others would they be going? who actually leave private uh, business to come into government? Yes, we do have. Why, do, why is that move then? You see, either sides, they have their benefits and they have their disadvantages. Mm. Yes. If you are in the government employment, the chances of you furthering your education, getting the study leaves, the job security, that is what attracts people towards the government, not the money. In the private sector, you'll have the money, that, but probably you may not have that time to go back to school. They may not even sponsor you. So it's because of that growth that uh, you, you evaluate. And uh, we, you know, uh, I think there is this um, a notion that has been created that medics love money and we follow money. <laughs> mm, some do. Uh, just just like kidding. all other human beings, some do. If medics <laughs> move themselves out of the human race, then what you're saying would apply 100%. But so long as they're human beings and they're Kenyans, yes, there are those who pursue money and they love pursuing money at the risk of even their own jobs like mm. other Kenyans do. Now, what I'm saying, I'm not saying that medics do not appreciate good money, but what I'm saying, it's not the sole thing that mm. we look for. 
when I joined government, wherever I was, I was earning much more. Hmm. But I joined the government because of other issues, because I want to further my uh, career. I want mm. to specialize and probably sub-specialize. But Peter, doesn't this balance it? I mean... So the government is an attractive employer? Yes. Depending on what you are looking for as a medic. Actually, we are taking that into consideration yes. and we are saying, given that the government is, is in fact, the largest employer. Mm. No, it isn't. Of medics? It isn't. Who is the largest employer? The private sector, and the mission, and the NGOs. Comparatively, give it a ratio. Mm. What does the government employ? What percentage is the government employ? I can give you a ratio employ? with clinic officers. Give mm -hmm. me clinic officers. Right now, we are about 25,000 registered clinic officers in this country. Yes. Mm -hmm. In government, we are only about 7,000. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. All the others are in NGOs, private sector. And, and the assuming others. that they're active, right? They are active. Okay. Because you cannot be retained, you cannot be given a retention license mm -hmm. if you are not practicing. Okay. Uh, How do you explain this, Peterson? Mm. How do you explain this situation? Why are they more? Does the same apply for, uh, to the nurses? Does yes. it apply to medical doctors? Yes. Do we have more facilities in the private sector, mission, and NGO? Than we have uh, than in, in, we have the in government? public? Um, I have not done that analysis, but I would assume so, because of course uh, where they are working. Yeah. But uh, the problem that we have on the government side is that we have a, 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 a severe shortage of uh, human resource mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that uh, the government does not seem to be in a hurry to address. Mm. Because if you look at some of the guidelines that have been produced by the ministry itself, like in 2014, they made something they call staffing norms and standards that provides for each facility should have how many nurses, clinic officers, doctors, and the others. And according to it, by 2018, we were supposed to actually have 16,148 clinic officers in the public sector. Mm. Now we are talking about universal health coverage. That, of course, means you have to get access nearer to where you are. Yeah. But then we are not even doing a half, half of, of the, the staffing norms and standards, not according to us, mm. according to the government itself. Mm. And so it's a problem, uh, the same that we are facing, of the neglect of the health sector. That is why we are having fewer because they are not being employed in government. And so they either have to open their facilities because the need for services is there. Mm. Or they have to be employed by others who open those facilities outside there. Mm. Peterson, it's the same government that has made it possible for all this to happen. Wouldn't you agree? Yes, it is. Because it isn't as though clinical mm. officers and nurses could open their own practices. The government allowed this. We Kenyans allowed this. Actually... <laughs> I'm trying very hard to balance this. Yeah. And you're trying very hard to ensure that the government gets no credit for anything. No, no, it's not that. Yes. It's actually that, uh, you know, there, there is a very bad notion we have as Kenyans that has been created by politicians. Even for the constitution, it looks as if it's for the government to be able to administer to the people. Mm -hmm. Well, actually, even the constitution, I think the opening statements are... We the people. The sovereign power. Yes, the mm. sovereign power lies with we the people. Mm. And even for that MP who is making that act of parliament to allow us to open these facilities, mm. we have delegated our power as the Wanjikos and Atienos, and uh, I don't know why they never say Kemanis, mm. so that uh, we can give them power to go and enact laws on our behalf mm. and enable us to facilitate the services that have been given as a right by the constitution. If you look at the constitution, the right to the highest attainable standards of health under Article 43, we give ourselves as Kenyans. We then uh, delegated our powers to this legislature to go to parliament to enact laws to facilitate attainment of these rights. Mm. And so, when they do that... Mm. It's not the government that is doing this. It's <laughs> we the people. It's we the people. Mm -hmm. Yes. So then at what point then do we blame the government? So when the money doesn't come to you, so we, the, we people. the people have not given ourselves money. Is that it? No, we the people have given our taxes. We yes. the people have, ha the, have given but laws the, that have adopted but, a budget but, declaration. But the allocation, the allocation yes. of such. Relevantly. You see, 
I don't want this chicken and egg situation. Yes. But the point I'm trying to ask is, are health workers paid a livable wage compared to other Kenyans who are employed within the private or the public sector? A livable wage? Yes. Um, I think that will be very relative. It's supposed to be relative. And yes. subjective. Mm. And so, that is not something that I can be able to say about all the health workers. What I would say is that comparatively, whatever the health workers are paid currently in terms of the health risk allowance is not commensurate with the risk they suffer. So, with this clamor that has been going on, when we're talking about going on six months now, yes. um, with all of this happening, has it has it borne the desired fruit? Whether it was to get people to sit up and pay attention, whether it was to get more um, in your hands in terms of now power to be able to wiggle about a little bit, has it borne its fruit? Has it? I would say that uh, it hasn't as yet. Mm. And uh, because of the same problem that uh, the politicians did not want it. Mm. Um, we came out when we were told that uh, we have a constitutional moment. For us, we are very happy as mm. the medics. Mm. Because since devolution, I think there has been an outcry from ourselves that there is a problem with the how health care is governed in this country. Mm. And so when the BBI task force was put in place, we went before them, we presented memoranda, mm -hmm. and as well as other Kenyans who are not medics, and we said that we need to reform the health sector so that it can work for us. And we asked for a health service commission. And that was not just because we love a commission or we would want to come out of the counties. It was because we have looked at the other critical sectors, be it the police, the judiciary, uh, the teachers, and we saw that from the onset, they were considered to have a body that manages the human resource to ensure that um, uh, they, you do not have service interruptions. And that is why we were asking, why can't we have the same for the health sector so that we can have people who are dedicated, who are not politicians, mm. so that they can have technical solutions that improves quality, not political solutions, that benefits political outcomes. Ndugu Peterson. Yes. Right now as we speak, have you considered the drawbacks that a commission may have? You're talking about the benefits. Yes. Have you considered? We have considered. And, and, what, uh, and what conclusion did you arrive at? That the benefits would outweigh. outweigh. Okay. Yeah. Who would appoint this commission? Of course, um, the president would appoint probably the chairman. Right. Yes. Secretary General or Secretary, as they are called, of the Commission? Uh, according to how it was to be structured, they were to come from some institutions. Okay. From the Ministry of Health, from the Council of Governors, and the Human Resource. You know why I'm asking this question? Look at yes. the tussle that the TSC has with KNUT. Mm. There are those who argue that TSC is actually being used to kill KNUT. There are those who argue KNUT killed themselves. Mm. There are those who argue Coupet was being used to kill. Well, there are arguments galore. Yes. Now, I am saying, the moment you have a commission, and that's why I asked you who the appointing officers are, mm. do you think you could be jumping from the frying pan into the fire? I think uh, that is a valid argument. And uh, what I would say is, for us as health workers, uh, we took an oath to protect life. So what we look at first is... Is that patient on the other end going to get that quality? We believe with the HSC, with the Health Service Commission, that the patient will benefit more because there won't be service interruptions. Mm. Would the Health Service Commission be used uh, to cripple unions? I think it would at some point. As they are doing now, even when we're in the counties, you know that they have stopped the deductions to mm. cripple us as the unions. Mm. That uh, is something that we know that ca could happen. And as union, at any given time, we know that the government at some point, uh, they are strategizing on how to cripple us. Mm. Th that, is, that is something that we live with. So I agree that that is a very valid argument. But for the sake of Wanjiko and getting the quality services uninterrupted, mm. I think a health service commission so the would actually benefits. be better.
will will come from from having a health services commission yes and the cut and rat situation mm. between the commission and the unions will still exist it will still exist <laughs> even without a health service commission i can assure you it will still be there mm. um plight of healthcare workers in the country we've been talking about the health uh, services commission which is uh, not among those that are in the bbi recommendation so what are you as a union saying yes or no to this bbi i think i don't want to get into the conversation of whether we are supporting or not because as unions what we do mm. we cannot be aligned to any faction oh. because uh, we we negotiate with the government of the day whichever government is going to come in and we give our members uh, a free space to be able to make their decision but what i can say is that in the bbi that we are having now it does not answer the question of we know that we have had a problem with the health sector mm -hmm. since it was devolved we have had more than 100 strike notices since 2013 while after independence up to 2010 we only had two strikes peterson did you dare have strikes in that particular era <laughs> in the time of president moi and the time of president kenyatta nikala and his group were the first people to actually do something serious and the consequences were dire yes they went on strike for six months. And the consequences were dire. People were chased out of houses. People yes. had to move. Uh, uh, but they opened the path to what is now being enjoyed. Mm. Sure. Yes. I agree. So if you look at it, I think what it means is that um, if we only had two strikes then, and we <laughs> have over 100 strikes, between issued then and now 103 issued between actually. 2013 and now 103 it yeah. tells you that after devolution there is a problem there is a challenge that came with devolution probably yes but probably also we are seeing the the benefits of operationalizing devolution meaning you actually do have an opportunity to have a voice where previously you didn't dare have a voice now you have a voice and having that voice is what all these things you're saying. It's mm. a manifestation of the openness of this system that we have. That is not a negative thing. When the president, uh, the, the third president of this country took power, His Excellency Mwai Kibaki, he gave free space mm. for everyone to be able to voice. Why didn't we have strikes then? You are still getting used to the idea. <laughs> Teachers went on strike, my friend. That, that would it hadn't be... <laughs> sunk in yet that this freedom was actually there. That would be there. Me mentally, psychologically, you are still mm. in the past and you're testing a little bit. Are we okay? Okay, this one, nothing has happened. Let's try again. Okay, nothing has happened. Next, they registered a union. Next. And then, remember, the implementation of this constitution came with Uhuru. Uhuru is, yes, President Uhuru is the one who has felt the full brunt of it. No other president has. Now, I think what I'm trying to say is that uh, if you look at the time of Kibaki and the time of Uhuru, the space for us to be able to voice and go on strike has been similar. Actually, in, Ki in Kibaki times, it was better. And has it borne fruit? Uh, I like think in Kibaki asked, times, it was better. And does it, with the strikes Why that we've it was seen, better? with the strikes that we've seen and yes. the engagement that we've seen, 103 strikes yes. in seven years. Yes. Has it gotten to the point whereby you say, okay, in order for us to get something done mm. and for us to be listened to, a strike then needs to come in place and then we get, the, we get it, what we're actually looking for. Has mm. it really worked? Now, I think there has been some improvements that have been brought about by the strikes. Like? Like uh, some of the improvements in the health facilities. Yes. The training of medics. Mm. Uh, to specialties and subspecialties, which of course translates uh, to quality of the services down there. But those were always and, there before. And even the UHC, no, they weren't. Mm. So few. Medics used to be sponsored by the government to be trained, brother. Uh, unless maybe I'm, maybe I'm, what I would, I would maybe, ask is... Uh, maybe I'm living in another country. Maybe what or maybe you need ask, to be specific. Uh, yes. Like uh, if I can ask, uh, maybe for specialties. How many neurosurgeons probably did we have before 2000? How many neurosurgeons <laughs> did we even need at independence? Uh, no, I'm saying uh, uh, by 2000, that was there's so a reason, many years. There's after. a reason why I've thrown you back at that time. I'm <laughs> yeah. simply saying, yeah. with the passage of time, you expect improvements. Mm. 
because new needs come about. Mm. Forget sub-specialities, sub-sub-specialities. Maybe what mm. he's saying is with the passage but, of time and the requirement for improvements, it was not commensurate with the time. But with the unions. That does not apply to this country. Now that started happening more vigorously. Oh, I do not doubt uh, because we're talking about the function and the effectiveness of unions. Unions are important. I, I'm not doubting that whatsoever. They are important. Uh -huh. What I am asking Peterson here is, Peterson, the reality of our situation and yeah. asking you as a medic, how do you balance this issue of the oath that you take yes. and going on strike? Let me explain why I'm asking the question. Yeah. Yes, you have problems, but then you put more lives at stake when you go on strike. Mm. Yet, you're trying to prevent your people who are in the front line mm. from actually putting their lives at stake. How do you balance this? Good. As we conclude. You know, our oath, I took an oath saying that I will do whatever I can to protect lives. That whatever I can includes uh, vacating the working place, if I'm posing more harm to the patient who is coming to me than giving them the cure. That is protecting their lives. And in this context, we were actually the super spreaders. No, it's very true. We were actually the super spreaders of COVID. You would note that after, after actually we went on strike, medics stopped dying and even the cases went down. <laughs> That says something. Peterson, people didn't start going to hospitals because there was nobody to take care of them. So you couldn't know whether people were dying or not from but, public hospitals. But, but the testing labs die. were open and the mission hospitals and the privates were there. Really? <laughs> so if somebody was really sick, they would be taken to a hospital somewhere. You are not a politician, Peterson. No, he's not a politician. Yeah. No, he's not. Mm. He's a union leader. Mm. You're just a union leader who yeah. speaks yeah. politically. Yes. <laughs> Thank you very much for joining us today, Peterson Mashira. Thank we hope you. to have you again soon. Eh? Thanks a lot and thanks for giving me a chance to be in the situation room. Thank you. Thank you for the good work you're doing. Asante. Thank you, Peterson. City, today's proverb. Right, right, right. Peterson, this one, I think you need to tell us what you think. Yeah. If you carry the egg basket, do not dance. Mm. It means that if you dance, they might spill over and break. Yes. Or, or even break in the, ba in the basket. Yes. Mm. That's it. Thank you very much for tuning into the Situation Room today. This is the Situation Room, the only way to start your day. Spice up your life.